Acts 23. And Paul earnestly beholding the council, this would be the Sanhedrin, and said, Men and brethren, remember he's in Jerusalem. He's talking to the men, Gentiles, unsaved, he's talking to the brethren, saved, or Jewish people. I have lived in a good conscience before God unto this day. A conscience is a great gift of God if you use it correctly. The Bible says you can sear your conscience. A conscience that God uses in someone he's working with will be, I'm doing something wrong, I need to get it right. And you got that conscience, you got a healthy conscience, do what God wants you to do. Do not adhere to destroy your conscience. Conscience is a good thing. It's a good, I don't know what you call it, but that he's put into man to realize that you're a sinner, you've done something wrong. And high priest Ananias, look at this, he's still in the picture, commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. I have a, I have a good conscience before God to this day. He's in the high priest, smack him. Now, there are many people who raise Paul on a pedestal, and they take Jesus Christ down. Then said Paul to him, God smite thee. Thou whited wall, for sittest thou to judge me after the law, and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law. Paul got angry. Jesus did not get angry when he was bruised, punched, whipped. Paul gets smacked in the mouth. What's your problem? And that sets Paul apart from Jesus Christ. Hey, listen, I'm no different from Paul. You're going to smite me, and I got I'll have to hold back a little anger. But what we're seeing here is Paul is human. He's a sinner. And rash, he just anger. He looks at that, that high priest and says, who do, you, who do you think you are? I've done nothing wrong to the law. Why'd you smite me? And they that stood by said, revilest thou God's high priest? And that's a joke because what Paul will write in Hebrews about Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is the high priest. Your office is gone, buddy. You want to take a look into that, that temple right now? The veil's been ripped. You probably sold it back up, but the veil's been ripped. Your office is gone by the blood, testimony, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. There are no more high priests but Jesus Christ. But we're not going to learn that later on to whoever writes Hebrews writes that. But we know that because we have 66 books. Paul doesn't even know this yet. God's high priest. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. No longer. The Old Testament's gone. That went out with John the Baptist. Jesus said the law, the law and the prophets were unto John. Jesus Christ had his own little dispensation. And God's high priest, you killed God. Jesus Christ. Paul is standing before a murderer. I'm God's high priest. That's exactly the respect the Pope has over his people. I'm God's Pope. Then said Paul, now watch this, America, Christians. I was not, brethren, that he was the high priest. For it is written, thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. Look what Paul just said. I got a little anger there, but you know what? I wish you weren't in the position you were. I wish President Obama was not president of this country, but you're not to speak evil of the ruler. Paul may not like that high priest, but he didn't speak ill of him. And he quoted the scripture saying, you know what? I can control my mouth. I may have lost it in verse 3, but I ain't going to lose it in verse 5. You're still in charge, and God still has you in charge. God is not taking you away, so I'm not going to speak ill of you. American Christians need to have that aspect. Last eight years. And you don't realize, unless you confess your sins, your Facebook post will be held accountable at the judgment seat of Christ. I don't care you don't like it. Listen. This high priest is the one that had Jesus Christ crucified. This high priest is the one that had John and James, uh, and well, had John and Peter whipped, had James, 
turned over to the Roman government to be headed, would have Peter in jail, would, would uh, have Paul go out and crucify and kill and prison and punish Christians. Paul knew who this guy was, and he didn't badmouth him. As far as I know, the President of the United States, as far as I know, any of them did not crucify, did not uh, uh, persecute, and did not uh, whip Christians. Any of them. And this is the high priest. Paul's testimony that we just read in chapter 22 and chapter 9, this would be the guy that gave Paul the letters to go to Damascus and get them. Let's see. Look at 22.5. As also the high priest does bear me witness in all the estate of the elders for whom I received letters unto the brethren and went to Damascus to bring which, which were there bound unto Jerusalem for to be punished. He is standing before the guy that would have Christians persecuted. He says, I can't say nothing about you because the scripture says I ought not to. You even sent me. And I'm not going to say nothing. But when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees, Sadducees, Sadducee, we'll see in a minute, and the other part Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. Now what that statement is, the question is, Jesus Christ raised from the dead? Yeah, right, Paul. Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father? Yeah, right. Remember, when Jesus came to life and showed himself to the apostles, showed himself to the people, over 400 people, it looks like the scripture show. He didn't go to the lost. He didn't go to the unbelieving. The high priest, Ananias, and his crew did not ever see the resurrected Jesus Christ. So they stand in doubt. We didn't see him. Thomas did. Over 400 people say, and Paul's being questioned now about this Jesus that you say is risen from the dead. Where's his body? Oh, we paid a bunch of men to say, so. yeah, you paid him. And when he had said, there arose a decision, dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. Oh, we split the room. For the Sadducees, said you see, Say that there's no resurrection. Well, they wouldn't believe in Jesus Christ. They're going to hell. That's what they've been preaching throughout the book of Acts. Neither angel nor spirit. But the Pharisees conf confess both. So with the teaching of Jesus Christ at this assembly, Paul puts them at odds with each other. They're sitting in unity. Paul brings up a message that puts them against each other. We don't believe this. Well, we believe in that. We'll fool you on you. We'll fool you on you guys. Now Paul's standing in the middle. And there arose a great cry. And the scribes that were of the Pharisees part arose and strove, saying, We find no evil in this man. But if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. And read that in 538 and 39 in the book of Acts. All right. Paul appeased the Pharisees. If something has talked to a, a spirit, if an angel, well, that had to come from God, we can't fight against it. The Sadducees, we don't believe in anything. He's a liar. Eat, drink, and be merry. We're going to die and get buried in a grave, and that's it. That's the end of all life. We don't need this Jesus. Life is Once, once life is over, that's it. There's no nothing. Boom. Just darkness. And when there rose a great decision, man, he's got an argument going on in this place. The chief captain, this is that Roman guy that picked up Paul, that brought him from the saving of the Jews who were going to annihilate him. Fearing least Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them. Do you see the picture there? 
one group has got Paul's left hand, the other group's got Paul's right hand, and uh, we used to have these little Gumby dolls when I was a child. And you could stretch this thing, a stretch arm, another toy was. You could, it was a rubber toy you can just stretch out, and it's recorded, here is Paul. This Roman guy is now the centurion. has got to save Paul a second time. He's afraid they're going to pull him in pieces. Commanded the soldiers to go down and to take him by force from among them and bring him into the castle. Paul is causing... Can you imagine what Paul would do if he walked into your average Baptist church in America or throughout the world? In the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. That's where God wanted him, remember? He's to, what God's telling Paul is, brother, you sinned. You did right. You preached about me. You, 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 but we got a little problem here. In Jerusalem, you testify at me, but you've got to go to Rome. It's, not, it's just, you don't belong here. How do you feel, buddy? You're sitting in this castle. The only ones you can witness to is the soldiers that are at your hand. You could be witnessing to groups of people right now. You could be standing at a seaport. You could walk into a synagogue, but you can't. Because you've gone somewhere where I told you not to go. I'm going to use you. But I can't use you to the fullest. And when it was day, certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves upon a curse, under a curse, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. A hunger strike. Right here in the Bible. Here's a hunger strike to kill a man of God. Nothing new under the sun. And they were more than 40 which had made this conspiracy. Did you see what the Bible said? We're not going to eat or drink. We're going to have a hunger, stri hunger strike to kill a man of God. And it said it's a conspiracy. It's also sin. Thou shalt not kill, but... Some people may have realized when they stand at either judgment, they may be charged with conspiracy, and they don't even realize they're doing it. And they came to the, listen, there, there have been Baptists who have had that attitude. There have been Catholics that, we're not going to do this until you do this. A nation right now is in conspiracy because we didn't get our president. We're not going to go back to school. We're not going to have a uh, peaceful uh, assembly. We're going to riot and it'll cause all kinds of trouble to you put our person in the office that we want. That's a conspiracy. That's where America is today. And they came to the chief priests and elders and said, We have bound ourselves under a great curse that we will, that we will eat nothing until we have slain Paul. That's a great curse. You're not going to have anything to eat or drink. Well, you can only do that for so long before you die of, of uh, malnutrition and, and um, uh, dehydration, starvation. You're only going to last so long. For what cause? Now, therefore, ye with the council signify to the chief captain, that's the one that's been rescuing Paul, they're going to get this Roman soldier, this centurion, but they're going to get him in a trap. They're going to risk his life. Great people. Do you realize your sin not only affects one person, but affects others? That he bring him down unto you tomorrow. In other words, notify that, chief, that captain, that centurion. Say, hey, listen, bring Paul to the council tomorrow. As though ye would inquire something more perfectly concerning it. Say you're going to ask him some more questions. You're going to, you know, you're going to give him another trial. And we, or ever he come near, are ready to kill him. Well, there you go. 
And when Paul's sister's son, his nephew, heard of them lying in wait, he went and entered into the castle and told Paul. I don't know how he knew this. I don't know where it was, but the Bible records and doesn't even name the young lad. Then Paul called one of the centurions unto him and said, Bring this young man unto the chief captain, for he has a certain thing to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the chief captain and said, Paul the prisoner. What? What's Paul called? He wouldn't have that name if he was in Rome, would he? That's his name while he's rebelling against the word of God. Paul the prisoner. And he did not need to be there. Paul the prisoner called me unto him and prayed me to bring this young man unto thee who has something to say unto thee. Then the chief captain took him by the hand and went with him aside privily, privately and asked him, What is it that thou hast to tell me? Now take this by the hand. I assume that this is a little child. You know, you ever see it like a mother comes, come with me, child? I don't know. And he said, The Jews have agreed to desire thee that thou wouldst bring down Paul tomorrow into the council, as though they would inquire somewhat of him more perfectly. But do not, but do not thou yield unto them, for there lie in wait of him, of them more than forty men, which have bound him themselves with an oath or curse. See what oath and curse is? Scripture is scripture. Be careful of your oaths, because it can be a curse. That they will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now they are ready, looking for a promise from thee. Man, they're out the gate right now. They're looking. They know what route they'll take. They know what corners. They know where to. They're right now, as they're speaking, they're ready to pounce on Paul. So the chief captain then let the young men depart and charged him, See thou tell no man that thou hast showed these things to me. And he called on him two centurions, saying, Make ready two hundred soldiers to go to Caesarea, and horsemen threescore and ten, and spearmen two hundred at the third hour of the night, four hundred and seventy-two soldiers Paul's got. Paul says, I have not reframed the, 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 the gospel to all men. There's 472 people that probably would hear Paul speak about Jesus Christ. That's a lot. What are they going to do? Leave them? <laughs> Worst they can do is bash him in the mouth and make him shut up. But even at the point they make him shut up, he's already spoken something about Jesus. Third hour of the night, so this, if this is Jewish time, this would be about 9, 9 p.m. And provide them beasts that they may set Paul on. Ooh, look at that. Paul gets transportation. And bring him safe unto Felix the governor. And he wrote a letter after this manner. And the letter is 26 to 30. Claudius Lysias, Lysias unto the most excellent governor Felix sendeth greeting. So we learn who this chief captain is, Claudius Lysias. The governor is Felix. So he's sending Paul to the governor. We got trouble here. This man was taken of the Jews. True. And would have been killed of them. True. Then came I with an army and rescued him. True. Having understood that he was a Roman. Lie. Remember when Paul, they're taking the throngs. They're ready to tie him down to be beat. He said, you, can you do this to a Roman soldier, Roman citizen? And that was back in, I think that's last night's chapter. That was chapter 22, 25 to 30. And they were afraid, because, oh man, this guy's a Roman. A little lie here. And when I would have known the cause whereof they accused him, I brought him forth into their council. I brought him forth to Jews. I brought him to the Sanhedrin. Whom I perceive to be accused of questions of their law. 
but they have nothing laid to his charge worthy of death or a bond. It was a kangaroo court. It's like Jesus. They had no charges. They did not need to handcuff him. They did not need to, to have a death sentence against him. But unlike Christ, Paul was not where he was supposed to be. And God had told Paul, I'm going to put you in bonds if you do it. Paul's like, I'm not only willing to be put in bonds and all that. I'm willing to die. Yeah, you had it a couple times, buddy, already. And when it was told me how that the Jews laid wait for the man, I sent straight wait to thee and gave commandment to his accusers also to say before thee what they had against him. Farewell. Now there's the letter. This guy, it's been told to me there's been a, a conspiracy. I'm sending him to you for protection. I'm going to tell those Jews, you better go to Felix if you want to have anything to do with Paul. I'm going to send you to the government where you had no control over Jesus. Then the soldiers, as it was commanded them, took Paul and brought him by night to Anapatrius. On the morrow they left the horsemen to go with him and returned to the castle. So half the cavalry that was with Paul turned around and go. I've always wondered it's because he's witnessing the gods. I've had it with that guy. Can we go home? <laughs> I'm just, just wondering. I don't know. But some of them go home. Who, when they came to Caesarea and delivered the epistle to the governor. Oh, we just read an epistle. What's an epistle? It's a letter. Look at that. And that epistle is in our Acts book. So we have another epistle written in our Bible that Paul did not have. Paul probably never ever saw this letter. And yet Luke puts it in here. I'm not saying this is an epistle like, you know, it should be the 67th book. I'm not saying that. This is an epistle within a, a, a book. And you got to wonder, did Paul ever see this letter? Until Luke wrote the X. And I wonder, how did Luke get it? How did Luke get a, a letter? One, two, three, four, five verses long that went to the governor of the Roman government. Can I have a copy of that letter, please, so I can put it in a button? I don't think so. Felix, you know, God's having me write the book of Acts of the Apostles and all that. In chapter 23, I need a copy of your letter. Can I, have a, can I get a full stack copy of that letter, please? I don't think so. Yet, yeah, here it is. The Bible is written by man. Really? How did this letter get into this book? And if it did reach Luke, if it did reach Paul, how on earth did this Roman letter get to them. You think Claudia, you think Felix have to get this? Oh, I gotta put this in my scrapbook. It's an excellent letter about the Apostle Paul is going to write all these books. Really? Do you think so? I don't think so. Why would this letter survive? Then the soldiers, as it were, they commanded them, took Paul and brought him to the night to Anna Parters. And we verse 33 we're at. Who, when they came to Caesarea and delivered the epistle to the governor, Felix presented Paul also before him. Here's the letter. Here's Paul. And when the governor had read the letter, we just read it, he asked of which province he was. And when he had understood that he was of Cilicia, I will hear thee. This is Felix, he said, said he, when thy accusers, the Jews, are also come. And he commanded him to be kept in Herod's judgment hall. So Paul's not free. He's in jail again. Another night. In Rome, he wouldn't have been in jail. He's being used, but not to his full potential. And when we let sin get in our life, God can still use us. But there's no full potential. And you realize... We are going to have enemies. All they that live godly shall suffer persecution. And if you live right and do right, somebody out there wants you dead. Do you realize that? And except for Paul's nephew, he would have never known. 
People wanted Jesus dead. People wanted Peter dead. People killed James. People killed Stephen. Do you realize right now, if you're actively, however, me street meeting, but however you witness for Jesus Christ, you go in all the world and preach to God, do you realize you are on somebody's death wish? And I'll tell you who that death wish is. I'll tell you what list it is. I'll tell you who's making a list and checking it twice. It's Satan. Satan wants Bible-believing Christians that witness and do what God's told them to. He wants them. <coughs> excuse me. He wants you dead. And he can find over forty people say, "Hey, I'll listen to you. I can set a government against you." People are all too happy to serve Satan against God. Who else would worry about a man like Paul who can go out with the gospel? Satan would worry. I guarantee when Paul woke up in the morning, and I'm not like this, but I guarantee when Paul woke up in the morning, I guarantee there were angels that had already set their alarm clocks in hell before Paul woke up to get on his guard every time he, he went out through the day. I guarantee it. Paul would have kept the, 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 the devils, the angels of hell occupied all during his life trying to prevent that gospel to go through. When you preach the gospel, when you sow that seed, the very first thing that shows up, according to the parable of the sower, is Satan. And if he can't get you, he'll get that word, he'll snatch that word. If he can't snatch that word, he'll get the converts. That have grown. He'll attack them with the world. He'll attack them with persecution. Don't you see what's going on in the book of Acts? And then man himself is a sinner. Paul's a sinner just like all of us. None of us are perfect. And we are, if we if we sin and we try to do it, we are sometime in our, in our life, if not right now, sometimes... We are not being used to our full potential because we've got sin. We've walked a course that God said, I don't want you. When you read Pilgrim's Progress, Pilgrim, and I forget which friend he had, they go off to Doubting Castle. And I don't know, I don't know if that book tells you how many weeks that was, but it was a long time. Pilgrim lost time at Doubting Castle until the Lord put him back on the path where he was supposed to. And yet, Pilgrim was used when his wife and his children came along and other ventures on the path. Pilgrim was used because when he came to that path, Pilgrim put a sign, warning, don't go this way. But Christian had to lose a long time. We'd be best if we just judge ourselves and listen to God perfectly. But then again, we're sinners.